Hi, this is Randy Finney with Right Side of the Chart, and today is Thursday, September 26, 2013. In this video, I'd like to do a quick overview of the S&P 500, uh, as well as the top 10 components in the index. Uh, the reason for that is the top 10 components in the S&P 500 constitute uh, or represent a weighting of nearly 20% of the entire index. So once again, the top 10 stocks make up or are responsible for almost a fifth of the total returns of that 500 stock index. So as with the QQQ top 10 holdings, which I discussed yesterday, uh, you know, the, the logic behind that is where these leaders, these, these uh, mega cap stocks go, the top 10 holdings, uh, the rest of the market is likely to follow. Uh, so I like to really sometimes dig down in the charts of those top 10 holdings to get some insight, maybe a little additional insight than uh, to, to where the index might be heading than what the actual uh, chart of the index itself can tell us. Uh, we're starting out here looking at a weekly chart, weekly time frame of the S&P 500. This chart was posted and discussed in static format on, on, the, on the site just the other day. You can take a look at that. Nothing's really changed here. I had these uh, Fibonacci time zones that I had talked about. And what's interesting is currently we have two time zones uh, really overlapping or coming in within very short order of each other. Uh, the first sequence started back, these blue lines here, on the uh, uh, March 2009 lows in the market. And I set the, the next uh, level at the peak high here uh, when the market topped out in early 2010. That was a significant reaction high. And then the rest of the lines auto-populate based on the Fibonacci sequences. And uh, I also took a reaction low. It's hard to see, but right on this trend line, at this white up trend line and where the top of my cursor, the finger is pointing, there's a, a sharp spike down, a candlestick. That was a reaction low followed by this uh, reaction high here. That's where the next sequence began. And we have uh, both of those uh, sequences come in right around here. Something to note, these aren't exact levels, just as when you're using Fibonacci retracements on price, uh, you know, the horizontal retracements. Um, what you want to look for is turns on or around those levels. You know, they're, they're not like anything else. They're not 100% effective, but typically on, on the, uh, both on the retracements and these time zones, you give a little bit of leeway. In fact, if we zoom in and out of this chart, if you look at the, the current uh, time zones that come in, you'll see as I, as I zoom in and out on this chart, those lines move a little bit. So again, this is what really what we'll call a, it's a cluster and it's a window just indicating that if history tends to repeat itself and these fibs, they, they surprisingly do uh, often call a lot of the major inflection points in the market, not always, but uh, the fact that we have two coming together in close proximity uh, means we may be looking at a major inflection point here in the market soon. So enough on that. Again, this chart you can reference in the uh, posted on the site in the last few days. That's a weekly chart. And uh, let's take a look real quick at the daily chart. What we have here is uh, or are several patterns, as you can see, the, you know, the S&P 500 has clearly been and remains in a, in a longer term, both a long and intermediate term uptrend. Uh, we've had wedges, bearish rising wedges along the way, which have broken down and lead to, led to nice corrections. Uh, and currently we have this purple wedge type pattern, possibly an ending diagonal pattern. Um, I'm not an expert on Elliott wave counts. So I'll defer uh, to those who really follow Elliott wave to see if this fits in. But uh, uh, at first glance, it does have the symmetry or appearance of an ending diagonal pattern. And with the third and final touch at the top, that, that would indicate that uh, this pattern is, is really fully mature and, and likely will continue lower. Uh, something to note, as I noted on the site recently, is we have had a breakdown. We've had these what I call sub or minor uptrend lines, these white uptrend lines within this, this most recent purple wedge pattern. And we have a clear breakdown on there. So right now, prices have broken that uptrend line. And in the past, as you can see, we've had near full retracements. Um, you know, these look like 61, maybe 70, 80% retracements of the prior move. And we're in the early stages of this breakdown. So something to note. And as I often talk about, you know, if, if you have divergences, especially clear divergences in place uh, with trend line breaks, then more than likely uh, that's going to lead to some substantial downside. And because of these long building, really double divergences, we had, you know, double negative divergence in place here. My expectation is that uh, although I would 
expect to see some support here, a reaction on the bottom of this line, is that uh, we probably won't see the top of that wedge again. Prices will probably break below and at least come back to test this uptrend line, if not more, in the upcoming weeks to months here. So th that's my overall thought on the S&P 500. Now let's dig into the top 10 components. And these I will go through rather quickly today because I've discussed uh, a few of these yesterday. Uh, there is some overlap in the NASDAQ 100 top 10 holdings as well as the S&P 500. So Apple was one of the stocks I discussed in detail yesterday. Uh, we're looking at a daily time frame here. And the uh, significance here is this most recent uptrend line that I'm highlighting here. Uh, we had this uptrend line break and prices have now, they're still below their their recent highs and uh, maybe we can push up a little higher and back test that but as of now the in the at least in the near term slash intermediate term Apple is on breakdown mode um, overall the intermediate term trend remains higher but it's in question and jeopardy right now especially with this uptrend line break and I talked about a little bit about uh, the weekly chart here and uh, how this previous this trend line uh, from the last uh, bull market in Apple that led to a 61.8 percent retracement not shown here um, and this current uh, move after this uptrend line break for this bull market uh, stopped cold and did a double double bottom at the 50 percent retracement as you can see here and Apple the PPO is still really flirting with in bear market territory so if the stock can move much higher, that would be a bullish sign to see this this PPO clearly move into bull market territory. But again, that's, that chart was discussed yesterday, so I'm, I'll go ahead and move on to the next stock. Okay, this is ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil for years has been the largest holding or weighting in the S&P 500, uh, but in the last uh, year or so has piggybacked with between Apple. Apple, ExxonMobil. Currently, Apple takes the lead by a little bit, uh, but ExxonMobil is right there close by as the second largest component of the index. And we're looking at a weekly chart here, which is all I'm going to focus on. Um, what I'm looking at are is ExxonMobil challenging, recently failing to take out multi-year, or I should say all-time highs that were set back in 2007, 2008. We had a triple top here. Uh, failed triple top pattern that base broke down this was the base this this horizontal line was the base of that triple top pattern prices broke down and came back to retest and uh, ExxonMobil was in a bear market for years currently we're pushing up in this very large ascending triangle actually more of a wedge type pattern and prices have clearly broken down we had uh, unmistakable negative divergences multi-year divergences building on that pattern and let's zoom in a little bit here. Prices have broken down. And what I'm looking at, it's not really drawn out here, although I could throw that on real quick. We have a, what looks to be a very, oops, sorry about that, a very clear um, bear flag pattern. Uh, so we had a breakdown. Let me, let's just add that here. Create parallel line. Throw that up on top. There's your bear flag pattern. Uh, from the top here, the peak where we failed, it actually punched out, temporarily made a new high. If you look very closely there, we did go over the recent highs. And that, my friends, is a, a fake out or a false breakout, a.k.a. bull trap. Uh, tends, uh, new highs tend to suck in a lot of money because in, in, on face value they are bullish. Uh, but, of course, these divergences would have warned some people otherwise to, to maybe not chase that breakout. And it indeed failed and is uh, bull traps or failed breakouts often do we saw some very impulsive selling so what that has done is set up a what we call a flagpole from this move down uh, at the highs to where we at we see this near near uh, vertical plunge and that is our flag so to to uh, measure out a bear flag pattern uh, you simply take the distance of the flag which is this line here and add it to the top of the pattern and this gives our projection Coincidentally or not, I've had this support line here for a long time, uh, and that's about where the projection uh, for this this trend is if and when ExxonMobil breaks down. Remember, I'm, I'm doing these videos uh, today, yesterday on the top 10 holdings. Uh, some of these stocks have already broken down longer term, like ExxonMobil here on the weekly chart, but many are still just above key support levels on the daily chart. So 
you know, the market at this time remains, remains in an uptrend on most metrics, short, medium, and long term. Um, but those those trends are in jeopardy, especially if these levels give way. So this is what, what I'll be watching for on Apple is a breakdown. And because this is a weekly chart, I'll be looking for a, a weekly close below this bull, uh, bear flag pattern, uh, which would likely indicate Apple, I'm sorry, Sorry, folks, trying to talk fast here to get through this. ExxonMobil will likely head down to that $80, $81 area uh, in relatively quick order. That's typically how bear flags play out. You usually have a, a just a, a similar impulsive downside move once the pattern breaks. So there's ExxonMobil. Okay, and here's Google coming in at number three. The third largest weighting in the S&P 500 is Google. And... We have, uh, I discussed this yesterday and I won't spend a lot of time. I'm already getting a little behind where I wanted to pace this video. So uh, I talked on these Fibonacci fam lines on the daily chart, how well they've acted as price and resistance, uh, support and resistance, and mentioned that the next key support level is this intersecting horizontal support line on Google, as well as this 61.8 Fibonacci fan line here. So that is my expectation if there is continued downside in Google uh, to see some key support on the first of one of these two lines, whichever come into play first. At this point, if, if Google moved down sharply in the next few days, it would likely hit both those lines together. So either way, uh, just a confluence of support there to watch. But more importantly, today I wanted to talk on uh, the weekly chart on Google, which I did not discuss yesterday. And uh, really, I wanted to look down here. If we take a look, let's zoom in here on the RSI. Let's move this down a little bit or move this up a little bit. Okay, here is the RSI on a weekly chart of Google. We're looking at a 10-year chart. Uh, so what, what I've noted here between these blue circles and a couple of these arrows, these white arrows just represent minor overbought readings. You know, the overbought level on the RSI is considered any reading of 70 or higher. Uh, so the blue circles represent extreme overbought readings, uh, which is an, is not has not been uncommon on Google. Uh, Google is a high beta uh, technology company, and as such, you know it, it tends to have very strong uptrend, uptrends, very st strong downtrends. So it can get quite overbought, quite oversold. But the point is, if we just look at this from a very simplistic point of view, we're looking at 10 years. I've marked every single overbought reading which if you add the arrows, the white arrows and the blue circles, that's 11 readings in overbought readings in the last 10 years. And my point here is not a single reading, let's, let's mark these out, has not led to at least some sort of correction. Even these mild overbought readings, and I'll draw these out, I'll look at the, I'll start with the, where price has peaked and to the trough. Now that might not look like much, we're looking at a log chart here. Because of the log scaling, it doesn't look like a whole lot, but these this is a significant price move. I, I don't can't tell you in percentage terms, but it's probably 10 or 20 percent. Uh, we had this this extreme overbought reading, and of course this was smack in the middle of a roaring bull market here. Uh, doesn't look like much, and it really was one of the more mild readings. Uh, let's clear that out. Uh, but uh, again, you can see the pattern. Let's try to draw these out. Correction here correction here and more more in line with these these type of pretty substantial corrections some lasted some were relative relatively quickly as i talked about prices often fall much faster than they rise and uh, that is one reason for my uh my penchant for shorting stocks because you can make quick profits in very short order uh, this wasn't the only correction. If you look at peak to trough, this was a correction off that overbought reading. And uh, forgot to put the white arrow up here, but here's another one. Nice correction, as you can see there. So I think you get the point by now. Every single overbought reading in the last 10 years has been followed by a substantial correction. You can pull your own charts, check the percentage pullbacks. I know, again, it doesn't look like much because of the huge move Google has had in the past decade. Uh, but again, these are quite large. Now, the only thing missing, and here's here's a minor, see a very minor overbought reading back here. Once again, an extreme. The blue circles represent the extreme overbought readings. And what have we had from this last one? Absolutely nothing. So 
do we have to get that? Does history ha always have to repeat itself? No. But if you play the odds, you play probabilities, this is really all technical analysis is, is about looking at past price patterns and trying to predict future movements. So uh, I would be very surprised if Google does not have a substantial correction uh, in the near term. Prices have now rolled off those overbought levels. We're still above the 50 level. Uh, what I tend to see on a lot of stocks is once you cross below that 50 level, the midline, that tends to have cleared out all the overbought conditions and leads to a you know a sustained rally following that, especially once you hit the oversold level. So, uh, so far, we have not worked off those overbought conditions uh, and, and really haven't had much, if any, of a correction. So that's Google. Take it for what it's worth. Okay, here's Johnson & Johnson, uh, the fourth largest holding. Same thing, let's just keep it simple. Let's look at all, all the overbought readings, which are circled here in blue, uh, what's happened historically. Again, this is not rocket science. Uh, I put this orange line here because we had our overbought reading right here. Um, and there was a little correction. Prices looked went higher, but they never really went much higher. I think there was a slightly marginal high over this point where we, we hit that overbought reading. Um, but then again, if you were short, or wanted to just sidestep the market. I realize a lot of you out there don't like to short stocks, aren't comfortable with it. This would at least say you don't want to be buying uh, Johnson & Johnson when, when, you, when the RSI gets this extended. Here was our correction, another overbought reading, and look at this very sharp move. So that was peak to trough there was very quickly. Even uh, then you can also look at you know how long the stock was really dead money. Sometimes we get these overbought readings and the corrections aren't very sharp, but the stock, because it became so overbought, takes a long time to work off those overbought conditions. So now, uh, oh, here's one here. I had a little arrow. There was an overbought reading right. Oh, gosh, I can't. Well, we had two. One, two. And I noted here, if you look down, I, it's probably hard to see these notes. I said continuation of overbought conditions without reset. So what happens is, Boom, boom. We had a double tap right here of the 70 level on the RSI, these two readings. And again, I talked about this on the last chart. Notice how on these other overbought readings, the RSI crossed below the 70 level and came close to, and in some cases actually hit the 30 oversold level. Um, so that is bullish, and that's what you want to see to have these overbought readings completely worked off. Here we didn't go all the way down, but again, we did cross below the midpoint, the uh, uh, 50 level. And what happened here? We had two overbought readings. The stock came down, did not hit 50, did not cross below, went back up, and we hit insanely uh, overbought levels never seen before on stock, especially a blue, blue chip stock like this. You know, when I looked at the chart on J&J &J a few months ago, and we did try a short here, and it was it was quite profitable. We hit it here at the top. I uh, had some very aggressive targets that we fell short of, so the trade went profitable and then was stopped out. But, you know, I don't know if I missed the headlines, if Johnson Johnson had cured the cur uh, found the cure for cancer or what, but this is just ridiculous, uh, ridiculously overbought, insane run for such a large blue chip company. And... Um, you know, as you can see here, I've marked we had some divergences here, strong divergences. I've really compressed the, uh, let's let's clear these lines out real quick. And move this back up. This white line here from this peak to this peak shows you, and again, it's a weekly chart, so it's hard to see here, but there were strong divergences on this high. So we had negative divergences both on the PPO and the RSI. And yes, they played out for a correction, but in my opinion, considering the scope of these overbought readings, uh, in conjunction with those divergences, uh, there is, is probably quite a bit more downside left to go on J&J. &J. Uh, I don't know what the supply-demand dynamics, what happened with the company, but um, to, to cause this, that looks like a very unnatural move, a lot of short covering, I'm sure, in there. Um, I've spent enough time on J&J, &J, but uh, I, I think the stock has more to come, more downside to come in the, in the uh, upcoming months here. Number five is Microsoft. I spent a lot of time on this chart yesterday, so again, you can reference that in the QQQ video. I also mentioned at which point I covered which stock, so you can just skip forward, fast forward on that video if you want to see Microsoft. But I talked about these, this key resistance zone here and how Microsoft has 
has been tapping, trying to get past that level for, for years now, many years, even going back to last bull market. And we had this big false breakout to new highs as look so far we may have had here. And that was really all she wrote before Microsoft fell off a cliff. So again, levels to watch. Same story with these overbought, over, yes, overbought readings. Rarely do you see them. And once you get them, they are almost always followed by substantial corrections, which we have not yet seen off this overbought reading here. Nor have we had these overbought readings reset by a, you know, a solid move below the 50 level as we did on all other previous instances. Okay, so again, another reason why these aren't exact timing indicators. These are weekly charts, um, but why I think the next few months in Microsoft will more likely be down than up. This is GE, General Electric. Um, what we're looking at, I have this resistance zone drawn here. And where I, where I come up with this is we had this, you know, a reaction, you know, in the last bear market in 2008. Uh, if you look at the volume at price histogram, there is a thin zone here. And the top and bottoms of thin zones on these uh, horizontal bars on the price volume at price histogram represent uh, support resistance. So we have that plus this reaction high and then the point at which GE just fell off a cliff. So prices have, since the stock bottom in early 2009, we've been in a bull market, but now prices are up against that formidable resistance area. Also while forming a uh, clearly defined bearish rising wedge pattern and uh, like so many others right now with uh, negative divergences in place. We'll have to zoom in a little bit to see it, but there it is from the weekly chart, negative divergences, uh, which indicate that uh, this wedge may break down soon. Daily chart, just to zoom in, this is not the same wedge. We're looking at a much shorter time frame here, but this is the key uptrend line that I'm keeping an eye on now. We have one, two, three, four, five, five reactions off the bottom of that trend line. Uh, clearly divergent highs put in at this point, negative divergence below. So this is the level that you want to keep an eye on for GE because if this daily wedge pattern slash uptrend line breaks, it will more than likely lead to a breakdown um, of that weekly trend line. So something to watch on GE. Chevron Texaco, this is a weekly chart here, working its way up within this large rising wedge pattern going all the way back to the 2009 lows. Um, similar uptrend line that we had leading up in the last bull market uh, in a very similar pattern. We had a divergent high, if you look at the top of the, the pattern here, sort of wedging with negative divergences on the weekly chart, both on the PPO and RSI. Uh, the only difference now is the divergences are much longer in scope and duration and uh, prices are coming towards the apex, really at about the, toward, right at about the point where wedges typically break down. So this is a key uptrend line to watch, a multi-year uptrend line for Chevron Texaco, one to watch. Zooming into the daily time frame, um, this isn't rocket science, CVX, like a lot of stocks, it's clearly still in an uh, overall uptrend in a bull market but it works its way up with a series of uptrend lines. As you can see here, when these uptrend lines break, we have corrections. Uh, uptrend lines continue, we get higher highs, corrections. These corrections are pretty steep. Most recently, I've been watching this yellow, uh, orange uptrend line. Uh, I noted divergences at the uh, recent highs. Right now, we have really a double top. If you look at the horizontal line from my crosshairs, that puts a double top here and here, Chevron Texaco. And I've also noted here, we have these minor uptrend lines, very steep uh, uptrend lines. And when you get a break of these uptrend lines, sometimes they want to come back in and make a back test or a slightly new high, but the corrections have been pretty substantial. So we have one, two, and most recently a breakdown of this third uptrend line, which indicates um, whether or not Chevron wants to make a, another thrust, possibly even put in a triple top high. I could see that possibility, but uh, I'm not going to play it that way. As of now, this stock is in breakdown mode. And again, uh, I'm really looking at that weekly chart uh, for a breakdown of that longer term uptrend line. Procter & Gamble, we're looking at a weekly chart. Same story uh, we've only seen in the last decade. Uh, this is coming off the edge of the chart, so it's a little questionable. I don't, either way, you don't see a correction there. I don't, won't count this. Uh, but let's look at the two overbought readings that we've had pretty much in the last decade right here. Back in 2000, late 07, 08, uh, we had a RSI getting very extended. 
uh, making a lower high, still overbought. I just labeled those one, two. So in, in essence, that was negative divergence. Price is making higher highs with the RSI overbought and making lower lows. And that, of course, as we can see here, led to this move all the way from the top, that is. And we have something similar here. Here's the RSI peaking out one, two making a much lower low after uh, reaching overbought readings, making that number two should be right down here. Um, making roughly equal highs, so my expectation, of course, at some point is a, is a correction there on uh, Procter. What we're looking at here is a weekly chart on Berkshire Class B. Uh, same story, these overbought readings. Uh, this one didn't lead to a very sharp correction back here in 2007, but as I mentioned earlier, sometimes instead of a very sharp correction, although it was, you know, it was sizable. If you, again, we're looking at log scale, so I imagine this was a 10% or so drop, uh, but it was also dead money for, for several months. These are, each increment here measures one year. So this is probably six, seven, possibly eight months of price action where Berkshire traded lower from that peak. So again, you don't want to be chasing longs when you see such extreme and rare we're looking at a 10-year price history here uh, very rare overbought readings uh, the next overbought reading led to this correction and then we had one here in 2010 uh, that was the initial drop we went on to make a marginal new high but really prices didn't ultimately bottom to that point right there um, so here we are today uh, more overbought, or at least we've been overbought for a longer period of time than any point, at least in the last 10 years. So, you know, we could go back longer and, and probably see the same thing. Uh, what have we had there? We've had so far this tiny little drop here in the stock. We're also, we also recently broke below this long-term uptrend line. So, uh, considering the fact that these these overbought conditions have not been reset. In other words, they have not even reached the 50 level, never, nonetheless dropped below it. Uh, I think over time, we're gonna have to clear work off all this excessiveness in the stock and uh, Berkshire's got a way to go. In fact, uh, longer term for some fundamental reasons, I'm very bullish. I think this might be the short of the, the next five years or so it has a lot to do with uh, Warren Buffett's retirement, uh, impending retirement, and, and, and some other factors that I'm looking at on the company. This is a daily chart of Berkshire. The last update I've made on the site, we were, I, I pointed out, I have this rising channel, ascending channel with the yellow lines, and I had added this midpoint line. I believe we were just above that at the time, and I said that uh, prices typically, once they break below, they tend to stay below the midpoint. When they break above, they tend to ride above the midpoint of the channel. And right after that post, uh, we did break down. And as expected, I thought we'd see a quick move down to the bottom of the channel, which we did. Now, as I talked about yesterday in the QQQ video, I've seen so many of these breakdowns recently, beautiful breakdowns of patterns and prices get sucked back up. Um, normally, I'd say that's bullish action, but I'm not going to uh, I, I don't think these will be very long lasting. I think this is a lot of short covering um, final stage uh, bull market fake out. So uh, I think regardless of that, regardless of my opinion, if we break below this, this is the bottom of the channel. If we break back below that, prices are flirting on that right now. Uh, we're likely going much lower. Keep in mind that if we had a divergent high on that channel, negative divergence is below uh, as measured from this peak to the previous peak. So that's one more reason that I think prices are going to go down. If they do fall below these dual support lines that I have here, if you look to the left, the volume up price histogram, this is a very, very thin area. So my expectation is that prices would fall rather relatively quickly down to this area. This would be my ultimate, ultimate swing target on Berkshire Class B uh, if and when these levels clearly give way. Okay, finally wrapping this up, uh, Wells Fargo um, seems to be a common theme here. Overbought, extreme overbought readings on the weekly chart, as we see here. And here, the only two, we've had a couple overbought readings, but not, not such extremes. They typically lead to major corrections, i.e. or and or trend reversals. Uh, so let's see what happens. We've yet to really clear out these overbought conditions. We're still above the 50 level. So we'll see where that goes. That's a that's a uh, weekly chart here. Let's look at the daily chart. Uh, Wells Fargo, if, if 
if you have a little deja vu right now, this looks a lot like Berkshire because if I'm not mistaken, I really haven't read up on this recently, but I know in the last year or so, this has been one of Berkshire's top holdings and maybe maybe the largest holding. And so where Wells goes, Berkshire's likely to go, and that's why these look almost identical as far as the channels. I hadn't added I have not added the midpoint here. Uh, but uh, we've already broken down on Wells Fargo, so again, Wells Fargo's problems will most likely be Berkshire's problems and, and vice versa. Okay, so, uh, this has been Randy Finney with the Right Side of the Chart, and I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. Have a great day.